All right, we're going to talk about hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is uh, part of statistics. It's helpful to uh, see whether or not uh, we believe two groups are really different from each other, to see if there are relationships that we believe are in the data. Um, so we use statistics to estimate population parameters. And so the, the most logical thing to, to think about is, um, are the things that we're seeing representative of the truth? And are the things that we're seeing really distinctly different? So we're going to talk about t-tests uh, in the context of hypothesis testing, and then some non-parametric tests very briefly, you know, how we can um, uh, do some two-sample tests that aren't based on t-tests. Uh, or uh, parametric statistics. So let's start off with some logic about what hypothesis testing does with interval or ratio data. Interval and ratio data, remember, are numbers, the way that we think about numbers like weight or height or speed, um, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 5,000, 5,001, 5,002, those sorts of data. Okay, so the logic behind a, t uh, a, a s hypothesis testing here is you collect a sample of data and you determine whether or not how likely it is that that sample could be drawn from a population with a known mean. Or in other words, I take a sample, how likely is it that that sample with its mean and its standard deviation, um, its standard error, is reflective of a true population? Um, the other way to do it is to take two samples. I go out and I take a sample, I go out and I take a sample, and I see whether or not it's likely that those two samples could have been drawn from the same population. So in other words, we're testing to see whether or not these two samples are similar to each other and whether or not they would reflect this unknown population. In the same way that a one sample test, you go out and you take a sample and you compare it to what we think the population looks like, a two sample test goes out and takes two samples or takes one sample and breaks it in two to see if the two different groups are similar and how likely it is that those two were drawn from some bigger uh, population that maybe is unknown. Now, some people get really, really overconfident about what it means to do a hypothesis test. Like, um, you know, this means that, you know, whatever, danger, 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 Will Robinson, like uh, lost in space, that, that, um, that robot. So think about what a hypothesis test actually does. We do the stat step. That's the math that everybody freaks out about. That's actually very easy because we can do that in a statistical program or we can do it in Excel or we can do it in a variety of different places. So you do the hypothesis test and you look for some findings. We can be this confident that this is the difference. Okay, great. But just because that's there, it doesn't mean that you've done it completely right. You need to step back and say, okay, well, could there have been other factors that would have influenced that relationship that we didn't measure? Did we sample correctly? Did we measure correctly? Like there are a whole bunch of things that we could have done or could have done wrong that, that make it so that the hypothesis test didn't come out the way that we think it should, or we're overconfident in what those findings mean. The other thing is that <clears throat> there is a, a really pragmatic or practical step that a lot of people overlook. And that's to say, what can I confidently conclude and at what level of confidence? Lots of C's there. Confidently conclude level of confidence. This is the part where we, we look at the statistical analysis. That's to say, how likely is it that these things are related to each other or not related to each other? And how big is that difference? That's the substantive step. Um, you know, let's say we enroll people in a program and it costs a million dollars for those people to go through the program. We take a sample of people who've been through the program, people who've not been put through the program, we compare them and we say, oh my gosh, they're statistically significantly different from each other. Oh, this is great. The program's working. And the people who've been through the program are much better than the people who haven't been. You say, okay, well, how much better? And is that how much better worth the million dollars it takes to go through the program? Like now they save, you know, maybe it's a hair loss program, you know, because I'm bald, and they save, you know, 20% of their hair, but it costs a million dollars. I'd be like, well, yes, the program does work and you save 20% of your hair, but is it worth a million dollars since you're only gaining 20% more of your hair? Probably not. So there are a lot of things that people jump to these conclusions because of statistical testing that we've really got to be uh, more aware of and we got to back away from. So... Now that I've got the disclaimer out there, let's talk about hypothesis testing. 
When we do hypothesis testing with samples, we have to understand the nature of the problem to determine which questions to ask. So we, we try to get a scope of what we're trying to figure out so we know what question to ask. One good way to do that is to restate, restate your hypothesis and your null hypothesis. I think that there's a relationship between being in the program and how much hair you retain from that previous example. That's the research hypothesis. The null hypothesis is people who go through the program are not different in terms of their hair as people who have not gone through the program. So in other words, going through the program, not going through the program, the people are going to retain the same type of hair. Research hypothesis, go through the program, you retain more hair. Don't go through the program, you retain less hair. Okay, cool. Now, what we would do is we'd gather data. We'd go out and we'd look at the people who've been in the program. We'd gather the sample, the sample mean, we'd calculate the standard deviation, the standard error, the standard error is the standard deviation of the square root of n. So in other words, we grab this data and then we do a t-test. Does this sample compare to this sample and what's the probability that the samples are the same? The null hypothesis, once again, is the is that there's no difference or that the samples are the same. And in statistics, what we're testing is the null hypothesis. We're not testing the research hypothesis. We're going to conclude about whether or not we can support the research hypothesis based on what the null hypothesis tells us. The test for the null hypothesis will tell us the probability that there is no difference, or in other words, that the null hypothesis is true. So we do the t-test, we find the associated probability, and then you determine whether or not you can reject the null hypothesis. That's the statement everybody remembers from statistics. How probable is it that the null hypothesis is true? If the null hypothesis is true, then we say, well, then the research hypothesis can't be true. But what we're looking to do is trying to reject the null hypothesis. Like, well, the probability that the null hypothesis is very small, like p is less than 0 0.05. There's a less than 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true. Well, that's not a big enough chance for me to agree that it's, that it's true. So I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. And I'm going to say, well, we're 95% confident that the research hypothesis is true. So once we've done that, most people stop. And I say, no, that's not what we've got to stop. What we've got to do is figure out if we've rejected the null hypothesis and we find that the research hypothesis is supported. We say, well, okay, well, what are the two, what are the differences between the groups and how big are those differences? That's where we look at the mean difference. That's the substantive conclusion that we can, that we can draw on these uh, hypothesis tests. Okay. Now, someone always asks, well, how, like, how confident do you need to be to reject the null hypothesis? Well, it depends. The truth is it just depends. Like, there are some basic standards that you can see those at the bottom of your slide. Most statisticians reject the null hypothesis at p less than 0 .0, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. Or in other words, the probability of the null hypothesis being true at 10%, that's p.10, uh, c, sorry, p 0 0.10, the probability of a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true, that's p less than 0 0.05, or p less than 0 0.01, or a 1% chance that the null hypothesis is true. Now, the statisticians who've come together and said those are the good levels of statistical significance, well, uh, why do they choose those? Well, there's some basic, um, there's some basic things that happen when you get... Um, those numbers like once you start moving away from 0 0.10 to like 0 0.12 0 0.15 you get closer and closer to the mean and um it's just it, they just aren't as different but other disciplines like psychology or sociology they don't even use 0 0.10 they'll use 0 0.05 well why because they want to be more confident okay that's totally fine in political science 0 0.10 0 0.05 0 0.01 um, in public administration the same thing so these are kind of arbitrary except they're also kind of not. So those are the standards. You can look at those. They might be important to you later. But also think about things like how, li about, uh, how confident do you want to be in predicting another terrorist attack? That's not, you should probably be pretty confident. Like I want to be like 99% confident before we start arresting people. That makes sense. What about the likelihood of an understaffed office? Are you okay with like a probability of being wrong at like 15%? Are you okay with having a 15% chance that you're wrong? Probably, because nobody's going to die, right? What about a homicide in a veteran's hospital? Well, we probably want to be a little bit more confident, right? 
So, uh, or having some serious harm to an endangered species. Like there are lots of these things that, that we have to just make judgments about how significant the differences need to be. Now, if you're working on a contract or imagine that you're running a, some sort of program or you're doing some scientific study, most likely those levels of statistical significance will be given to you by either your discipline or by your project sponsor or by your boss. And they'll say, well, we need to be this kind of confident. Most of the time that'll be 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. But nevertheless, the, these P values are the probability that the null hypothesis is true. And what we're actually trying to do as statisticians is test how likely it is that those things are true. Um, so we want to be maybe more confident that the two groups are not the same. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So a significance test, like a hypothesis test, is, a, is nothing more than a determination of a probability of an event. So if you go back to the sampling notes, if you start thinking about what, you know, what statistics actually do, we're taking a sample to try and represent a population. If we take two samples and test them together, what we're doing is actually not testing to see if they're the same. We're testing to see whether, how likely it is that those two samples could have been drawn from a population. And what we're doing is we're testing the probability of some event occurring, whether or not there's a relationship or no relationship. That's what a significance test is. When we state a hypothesis, we can indicate the direction of the hypothesis. So in other words, we can say, like, I think that this group is going to be bigger than this group. Or I think that if we do this kind of program, this sort of thing is going to go better or worse. Um, but we can also state a hypothesis without a direction. In other words, we could say, I think that this sample is going to be different than this sample. Okay, that's, but which one's going to be bigger, better or bigger? I don't know, but I just think that they're going to be different. So why does that matter? Well, if we're trying to see, um, in sampling, we talked about the T distribution a little bit. Um, if we use a means test, like a T test, um, what we're doing is we're seeing the difference between the two groups. And if one group is on this end or one group is on this end, uh, we don't know. And when we say, I don't know which group is gonna be bigger, we have to test to see if the difference is going to be bigger or smaller. And so we allocate our probabilities to both tails of the T distribution over here. Um, so in a two-tail test, we, just, we make a prediction that there's a difference, and we distribute the confidence level cutoff equally to both sides of the mean. In other words, we're saying we don't know if it's bigger or smaller, so it could be on either end. That's two tails. Now, if we make a prediction and we think that one is going to be bigger or smaller than the other, that's actually a one-tail test. And we're pretty sure that there's a directional hypothesis. So we say we think one's going to be bigger or smaller. We make a prediction. We distribute all of the probability of being wrong to one tail. And what it actually does is one-tail test makes it easier to support a research hypothesis and easier to reject a null hypothesis. So for that reason, most of the time, even though we might have a directional hypothesis, most scientists will have a two-tailed test, a non-directional hypothesis, and it makes it a little bit harder to um, reject the null hypothesis, a little bit more uh, strenuous or difficult to support a research hypothesis. So really, we don't see very many one-tailed tests, but I wanted to give you that little bit of a background so you understand if we get into Excel or if we get into SPSS, we talk about a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. Two-tailed tests are always for non-directional hypotheses. A one-tailed test only works for a directional hypothesis. So here it is. One-tailed tests are most often used in an applied or pragmatic practical work. They bring the distance required to meet statistical significance closer to the mean. In other words, they make it easier to reject the null hypothesis and uh, support a research hypothesis. But they can also overstate statistical significance when used with a non-directional hypothesis. In other words, um, if you tell if your stats program to do a one-tail test, it doesn't know which tail of the distribution to allocate the probability to. So it just says there's a one-tail test and then you, um, it makes it easier to reject the null hypothesis. So it's, it can be really problematic and it can, o it can over, um, estimate statistical significance.
two tail tests, most often used in statistical scientific research. Um, it makes it more difficult to reject the null hypothesis, more difficult to um, uh, support the research hypothesis. Uh, so it's a higher standard. Um, it can also be unnecessary if you have a directional hypothesis. Most of us would still do a two-tailed test anyway. Okay, now, in order to understand a hypothesis test, you have to know what the null hypothesis is and then what the research hypothesis is. And we're going to start getting into a one-sample hypothesis test. Um, <clears throat> what we need to do is say, okay, a null hypothesis is there's no difference. There is uh, no relationship. That's a null hypothesis. The research hypothesis is there is a relationship between these two variables. Uh, one thing does affect the other. They change together. Different samples. Okay. So in order to understand how these work, you need to know, understand what level of confidence, know what a null hypothesis is, and then we're going to think about what we expect and what we observe. Um, so once again, the nature of the hypothesis determines the type of a one-tail or two-tail test. Okay, a one-sample test estimates the probability that a single sample could have been drawn from a population with a known or a hypothesized mean. We'll give you an example of this, but let's say we go out and we sample air quality to see if we're in compliance with the rules, uh, the air quality rules. The air quality rules tell us what we need to hit. We go out and grab a sample. What we're doing is we're taking that sample with its mean its standard deviation because we're sampling across this maybe this region to try and get a sense of what that air quality is. Now what we're doing is, is based on the laws of probability, do these air quality samples, uh, are they no different than the standard, than the number that we have to hit? So we're, we're seeing, did this one sample get drawn from a population that has this standard as its true mean? And what we'll do is we'll see whether or not those that sample mean is different from from the um, standard different enough to say that the air quality is out of compliance or that maybe it's close enough that we say yep there's no difference between the standard and the sample a two sample test goes out and we gather data to determine the probability that the two samples could have been drawn from the same hypothesized, uh, same unmeasured population. Um, now, take let's take a, a mental journey really quickly. If I go out and I sample students at Cal State Fullerton, and I look at like GPAs, and I and I ask a set of students what their GPA is and what their major is. And I ask a set of students what their GPA is and what their major is. I, I've done this for a lot, a lot of students, and so there's no uh, knock on any of them. But I teach this 320 class, which is Introduction to the Bureaucracy. Public administration majors tend to score higher on the GPA than criminal justice majors. Now, criminal justice majors are going to end up you know, in a public agency as police officers, as social workers, as, you know, whatever it is, they work for the government. But public administration majors just like tend to think a little bit differently about government service, but they take the same class. So I go out and I take a sample of GPAs from, let's say, these two groups of students, and then I break them apart. So I look at PA majors, GPA, and I look at CJ majors, GPA. And what I'm doing is I'm comparing whether or not those GPAs could have been drawn from the same student population of GPAs and how similar those two are. Remember, the null hypothesis is a test to see if the groups are the same and how likely is it that those groups are the same. Now, if their two GPAs are really close together, the two sample GPAs are really close together, we'd say, well, yeah, like if it's the PA majors are like 3.05 and the CJ majors are 3.0, I'd say, gosh, those GPAs are really similar. But as that difference between the GPAs grows, that's to say, like, let's say that the PA majors are now at like 3.75 and the CJ majors are at like 2.2, would say, wait, 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 on average, the CJ majors are 2.2 and wait, 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 on average, the PA majors are, are 3.75. Holy cow, that's really different. Right, but, but how likely is it that they're the same? Well, what we have to do is we have to figure out like, What's the normal spread of those GPAs? Is it like 
everybody's scoring 2.2 or is it like there's a big broad range? And the same thing with the PA majors this is a big broad range. And if they're both a really big broad range, it's possible that they could be drawn from the same group, but it might be pretty unlikely. So a two sample test is determining whether or not these two samples are the same, but not directly. It's determining whether or not these two samples could have been drawn from a different population. So we'll talk about that really quickly. Uh, one sample test is very, very simple. We, um, the T is a measure of difference. What's the difference? Difference is subtraction in math language. X bar is the mean of the sample subtracted from the mu, or we subtract a mu. Mu is the population mean or the standard. And SE is the measure of the standard error. That's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Now the standard error gives an, error, an estimate of precision around our mean, how confident we are about our mean. And the, the sample t-test is standardizing the difference. So in other words, it's trying to get a good representation of, hey, look, this is where we should be, or this is what we expect the population to look like. How different are we when we take the sample? So it's like, how different is the sample from this mean, this population mean of mu? And then we standardize it for, by standard error. And what t then is a representation of is a measure of the difference between the sample and some standard. Now, when do we use it? We use it, like I said, in, in violations of air quality standards. So we go out and we sample and we see whether or not the sample is different than the standard. We do this water quality, we measure the water quality, the salinity, whatever it is, the turbidity, um, bacteria, what's the allowable amount? And we compare the sample to the allowable amount and we say this sample exceeded the allowable amount or it didn't exceed this allowable amount. Um, now, this is one of those weird things that you talk to a regulator about and they'll say, well, your average was 205 and the standard is 200. And you'll say, yes, but based on the laws of probability, like it might be 205 in our mean, but the variation is very large. Like it could be as low as 180 or as high as 210. And just based on natural variability, that's actually no different than being 200. So you can get a, like a single air quality monitoring station or you know water quality monitoring station that's, that's higher than the standard, but on average, everybody else is lower. And that sample from that day could still be in compliance because even if the sample mean is higher than the, than the population mean, the mu, there's enough variation in there that you can't be really confident that that set of samples is any different than the standard. What's another way? Uh, did we meet our productivity goal? What's our goal? And what is this person's productivity over the, some time period? Well, what's our goal is the mu and how does this individual perform and how different are they from the goal? Different is subtract. Mu, like mean over here is X bar. That's the sample. And here is the standard. Um, and then like something like, did we pay too much for waste disposal? Well, how do we know that? Well, let's go out and figure out what we paid and what we should have paid and compare what we paid to what we think we should have paid. And we can do this sample t-test. One sample t-tests are pretty rare, except for maybe regulatory compliance stuff. Um, most often what we end up doing is two sample hypothesis tests. Now here are the key components of a two sample hypothesis test. You need to have a good reason why you think that there's going to be a difference. Um, you could probably expect a directional relationship. Let's say we submit somebody to a specific program. We think that the program is going to improve them or not improve them. Um, we think that maybe if we're looking at HR, human resources, we're looking at, um, we want to see whether or not males or females make more money but we have a, a pretty good hunch that males make more money than females. Um, so the key components of a two sample hypothesis test are some reason, uh, some expected direction, and two samples with inferential statistics. That means to say that they are um, sampled well and that they're interval ratio data. Um, that, that works the best. Now, uh, it also works for, for other data that are collected, um, not, uh, ordinal nominal data, as long as we can make some inferences from the samples to the population. So 
here's some examples of two sample hypothesis tests. Imagine we take an individual and we subject them to a program or some experiment, and then we measure them afterwards. If the experiment does nothing, null hypothesis. If the program does nothing, null hypothesis. The measurement of them before and after will be the same. Uh, let's say we're doing like some drug rehab program. We put somebody who's addicted into the program. We measure them beforehand. They go through the program. We measure them afterwards. The null hypothesis is we anticipate no change. They'll be the same. But what we're hoping is actually that the research hypothesis is true. We take a measurement. We expect that they're going to change. That they're going to get better. And we compare before and after. And the difference between before and after should be big enough to say that they're really not the same. Um, let's see, there's another way we could do this is with a control group versus an experiment group or a treatment group. We subject um, two different groups of people to some program or some experiment or some test plot or whatever that is. A control group gets a measurement before and a measurement after. The treatment group gets a measurement before some treatment and then after. And we compare the two groups side by side. Um, did the treatment group and the, the control group, uh, were their averages on average the same? Or are they different? Now, the null hypothesis would say if the treatment is, uh, sorry, we believe that the treatment causes no change. Uh, OK, so how likely is it that this group of people who went through nothing and this group of people who went through something uh, are the same still? Well, we would do a two sample hypothesis test. Now, this is different than a before and after. A before and after is sometimes called a pre post or a paired two sample hypothesis test, a paired hypothesis test, where the individual's measurements from before are paired with the indivi that same individual's measurements after. They're paired together. This uh, control versus treatment group is called a, um, a, an unpaired or a two sample uh, hypothesis test. Um, and those two groups we're not measuring before and after. We're just measuring the outcomes to see if the outcomes are different. Um, another thing is you could actually just go and grab all, grab all the data. And then after you've grabbed all the data, divide that data into two different groups based on some key characteristic. So this would be one of those things like we do voter turnout by some demographic characteristic. So we gather all the data about voter turnout, and then we split it up by males and females or by Republicans and Democrats. Uh, same thing might happen if we go out and we sample uh, some piece of land or a, you know, a park. And we say, OK, well, let's look at all these parks in, in uh, these areas. If, what if we split them up by low income and high income group and see if they're different? Well, we're not going out in advance splitting them up. We've just gone out and gathered all the data about all the parks. And then afterwards, post hoc, we split up those two groups and we compare those groups based on where those parks are located to see if those parks are different. Now, um, the null hypothesis is HO. The research hypothesis is HA. So in all two sample hypothesis tests are that the HA, the research hypothesis, is that the two groups are different. The two samples are drawn from two different populations. Um, the null hypothesis is that the two samples are drawn from the same population. Or in other words, the two groups are the same. In other words, there's some population out there. We just happen to grab two samples. How likely is it that they're the same? Um, Let's do like a non-numerical logical example. So I'll walk you through this happens. Let's say the city of Queens is out to determine if they're private waste mine uh, contractors, CP, P for private, contractor private, cost more per unit of trash collected than the city services. So um, city um, collector, collection from, uh, um, yeah, from the city. Sorry. <laughs> collection private, collection city. So the null hypothesis is the research hypothesis. Well, the research hypothesis is that CP is not equal to CC. The research hypothesis would be that CP and CC are the same. In other words, private waste management contractor and the city services are the same. So the logic goes like this. The sample of the private, CP, reflects the true population of trash collectors. The sample CC reflects the true population of trash collectors. They're both drawn from the same population. So if the difference between CP and CC uh, is small, which if they're drawn from the same population, it should be about zero. 
the difference between CP and CC should be this like nothing because they're drawn from the same one. But due to natural randomness, they might have some small differences, right? But as the sample, uh, sorry, there's the distance between the value or the distance between the two samples increases, it becomes less likely that they could be drawn from the same sample or the same population. So if their differences are very small in the, in the costs, then we'd say, well, it could be just randomness. Maybe it's slightly higher, slightly lower, but they're really pretty much the same. But as that difference gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the difference between CP and CC gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes less likely that they could be the same. So as that difference grows, the probability of the null hypothesis being true goes down. So as the difference grows, the P or the SIG goes down. And what we're looking for is where that probability that the two groups are the same becomes less than 10%, P less than 0.10. Or the probability that they're the same becomes less like P less than 0.05. Or there's a less than 5% chance that these two groups are the same. So when we compare the means and using the standard errors in describing the sample means, we give it shape, um, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what that difference looks like. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the standard, standard errors because when we talked about um, describing our data, we talked about the means and the variation uh, in terms of how, how we describe data and how it's distributed. So we can give the means and we can compare the means, but that doesn't give it a sense of what the shape of those data look like. So we have to at least account for how widely spread the data are. So what we do is we test whether the difference between CP and CC is zero, or in other words, the difference between blah, 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 or zero equals CC minus CP. What does that look like when you flip this around? Well, I'll show you in a second. To do the test, we find the mean standard deviation and the standard error for both samples. We calculate a pooled standard error. Don't worry, Excel does this or SPSS does it. doesn't really matter. We calculate a T-score. A T-score is a representation of the difference between the two samples. Look up the degrees of freedom. Look it up in the table. Most of the time, you don't even have to do that now because Excel or SPSS does, S does that for you. So here's what the data looks like for some random example. The mean cost per tons of garbage if a private contractor, we take temp samples of invoices, the mean for the private is 526. Standard deviation is 125. When we do the math, standard deviation over the square root of n is uh, 39.5. The city services are 475 on average. The standard deviation is here, is this, and we get a standard error there. So we gather the data, we've run that stuff. Now what we do is we do this calculate a, a pool standard error. Now the reason you have to pool a standard error is because we believe that these two samples are drawn from the same underlying population. And if that's the case, then the variation in the samples should be representative of the population as well. How do we do that? Well, we have the two means, but how do we account for that in the variation? We pool them together to, to create a pooled standard error. Don't really worry about that. It's really easy. You plug it into the formula, blah, 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 blah. Then we calculate the T-score. So for, you know, mean bar for one, or sorry, X bar for one, X bar for two. This is the private minus the um, public. And I messed up here. It's 256. It should be 526. And you get this T-score. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, there's a T or a some value here of negative 0.95. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. That's just a representation of the difference. What we've got to do now is go calculate the degrees of freedom. And for a two sample t-test, it's n plus n minus two. So there were 10 sample invoices, 10 sample invoices for the other one. Add them together, minus two is 18. Okay. Now what do we do? We look up at the degrees of freedom, 18 right here. Great. Now we try and figure out whether or not our t-score was big enough or what the probability of the null hypothesis being true is based on our t-score. So we go from 18 over here to uh, false in between this number and this number, and would go back up here. Well, the probability of um, the null hypothesis being true is point, between 0 0.20 and 0 0.15. So it's less than 0 0.20, but more than 0 0.15. 
the probability of the null hypothesis being true is somewhere between 0 0.20 and 0.15. The probability that there is no difference is between 0.2 and 0.15. The probability that there is no difference between the two groups is between 20, 15 and 20 percent. Now does that conform to the, to the norms of statistical significance? No, we are not very confident about that. So, so what we would say here is even though those two groups look really, really similar in terms, really, really different, you know, 526 and 475, that seems like it's $50 per ton more. But when we run the test, there's a 20% chance that the groups are the same. Between 15% each, 20, 15 and 20% chance that the groups are the same. That's, that fails to reach statistical significance. Now, if it was like 0.5, if the p-value was 0.5, there'd be a 5% chance that those groups are the same. Then I'd say, well, there's a 95% chance that the groups are different. But that's not the way it is. Even though there's an 80% chance, a greater than an 80% chance that the groups are different, that's, that doesn't conform to statistical significance. So even though these numbers are big, they're different. They're not significantly different statistically. Okay. Um, so that, that gives us a little bit of sense of what a two sample t-test does. So going back to the different types of means tests, independent samples tests uh, are when you go out and you gather data and you compare two separate groups. They're probably not the same individuals. A dependent sample is another word for that paired sample I was talking about. You take that individual and you subject it to some treatment and then you follow up afterwards. Um, this is, happens in experiments, it happens in programs, it happens in parole, it happens in, uh, gosh, policing, it does all sorts of stuff. It actually happens when we do HR assessments, you know, human resource assessments. Last time you were this, we gave you this training, now see, are you better or are you worse? That's a dependent sample or a paired sample where the, the data from before is paired with data afterwards. Independent samples where we go out and gather, we split them up by groups, or we send two separate groups through different sorts of things and compare the two things, but they're probably not from the same individuals. Okay, dependent samples, this is what I was talking about, that the, each case is paired. You're measuring the same case at different times. This is an important. As, uh, this is like an experiment where you do a pre-test a subject, administer some stimulus, post-test a subject. You're trying to figure out whether or not that stimulus caused a significant enough change for them to be different. What were they before? What are they now? Same logic here. If the effect was zero, which is what the null hypothesis is, the measurements before and after are going to be really close to zero. But if that program caused some change, was that change big enough to say now before was this and after is this and they really are different? The probability that they're the same is, is very, very small. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you think about, uh, you know, one of the things I, I think about experiments all the time. I've asked students this before and it, it makes me smile. So that's why I'm smiling here. If I ask people how they feel about class, after they've taken a test, or sorry, before they've taken a test, and then after they've taken a test and received the results, you get really different answers. So what I would do is I'd record the name of the students, I'd gather, them, gather this data in some sort of survey, I'd administer the test, or return the test results, and then I'd gather the data by asking them the exact same question, and then I'd run the test. Um, and it's funny, you know, if they think they did well, they think they like the class more. And if they think that the test was really hard, they don't like the class as much. But what we're doing is we're pairing an observation from before with an observation after. Um, here's like what that would look like. We've got A through Z here, their score before the test, the score after the test, and then the difference. Now what we do in a dependent sample test is just like a one sample test. We're actually not comparing the before score with the after score. Um, you can do it that way, but a dependent sample test most often follows a one sample test where the, the t-score is um, what is the difference, the mean difference, uh, it looks a whole lot like a one sample test, and the mu, the population, is zero. 
So in other words, we expect zero change if the null hypothesis is true. The experiment doesn't work, like the stimulus didn't work. So what we do is we compare the difference between before and after to zero. And was the difference big enough to be statistically significant? So we can, whatever, go look, look, look right here, blah, 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 blah. We'd look it up. 25 degrees of freedom because we had 26 students. Uh, so we'd go down here, 25, and I would look for degree uh, 1.4. Now it's between 0 0.10 and 0 0.05. Let me show you how you do that again. Degrees of freedom down to 25. Then you go over and you look for the T-score. The T-score is uh, 1.4. So it's bigger than 0.13, but smaller than 1.7. So it's in between these two columns, 0 0.10 and 0 0.05. So cool. If we were in psychology, we'd say, no, it's not statistically significant. But if we were in a variety of other disciplines, we'd say, well, the probability that there was no effect is less than 0 0.10. Rephrase. The probability that the um, that there was no change in attitudes before and after the test is less than 10%. Wait, there's a less than 10% chance that there's no difference. Okay, that means that there's more than a 90% chance that there's a difference. Yes, absolutely. So what you could say is we're 90% confident that before and after attitudes are related to how they perform in the test or what the test looks like. So independent samples are the things that are most widely used. We use them when we cannot or do not match cases. So let's say we go out and we take a survey, we're doing some field work or whatever that is, and we come back um, and we start to do the analysis and we break those apart into different groups, you know, upland or wetland, um, you know, males and females, certain types of party, um, uh, and what we do is we compare those two groups to see if they're the same. Um, dependent samples are different. You have to design a dependent samples test. You measure before, control the stimulus, measure afterwards. Um, or you could look at something over time, like what the city's you know accident rates were with something. We made some change. Now we compare the city's accidents rates later. The exact same city over time. That's a dependent samples. Okay, now everybody freaks out about t-tests like, oh my gosh, I did this in stats and it sucked, it was so horrible. Okay, don't freak out. Simple mean, standard deviation calculations. You can just plug in the numbers or you can use Excel super cool tools or you could use SPSS. T-tests are super easy now. They have a whole bunch of applets on the internet that you can just like plug in the numbers and it does the math for you. Don't freak out about the math. You have to know though what a t-test does broadly. That's to say, what does it test? It tests the probability that the null hypothesis is true. It does not test the research hypothesis. What we do is we can infer whether or not that we can support the research hypothesis by looking at whether or not the null hypothesis is supported. In other words, if there's a strong probability that the null hypothesis is not true. Okay, so remember the p-value so each t is a measure of the difference between the groups or the difference between that sample group and, the, and some unknown population mean or some standard. The t represents the difference. It really doesn't make any sense outside of a table. What it does have is it has an associated probability. That probability is that the probability that the null hypothesis is true. What we do is we're testing the null hypothesis. There is no difference between groups. Okay. Now, if that p-value is less than 0 0.10 or 0 0.05, whatever your standard is, what, think about it and rephrase it. If the probability is 0 0.05, you say the probability of the null hypothesis being true is 0 0.05 or 5%. There's a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, cool. If there's a 5% the chance that the null hypothesis is true, there is a 95% chance that the research hypothesis is true. Cool. If you got that, good step. Now, after that, what we do is we say, okay, well, they're statistically significantly different, but what is the difference in the means? So if we go back to that city example, it was like 526 and 475. That was $50 difference. That's the mean difference. That's the substantive difference. 
That's substantial. Now, is it statistically different? No, it's not. Numerically, it's different. Magnitude-wise, it looks really different. But based on the laws of probability, those two groups are the same. Or we can't say with any level of confidence that those groups are any different. So look at all the steps that you're going through. We're just calculating, we're gathering data. Did we measure it right? Blah, 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 blah. All that stuff is not talked about because everybody freaks out about the numbers on the t-test. You're going to find that those numbers are so easy to calculate. What you have to do is now say, how do I interpret what that t-test does and what it tells me? And afterwards, how big are the differences between those groups? Those matter. Okay, so we've talked about means tests, t-tests. There are comparable non-parametric tests. They are not based on the mean, but they are based on some other attribute like rank or success or some other thing. Some are less robust like the medians test and some are more robust like a Mann-Whitney test, Mann-Whitney U. Um, there's a Wilcoxon test. There's a variety of, variety of them. If for some reason you don't feel like you can use a t-test, then you can use a non-parametric test. Now, I probably explained this somewhere else for you, but let me just explain this again. Parametric tests are based on interval ratio level data. They, they estimate some parameter. Interval ratio level data um, are numbers. One, two, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, and they have special characteristics. Parametric tests like t-tests also rely on having a large enough sample so that the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. What does that look like? We can talk about that in sample size or some other place. Between 30 and 50 gives us a t distribution that looks really like a z distribution or normal distribution. So if you have a small sample, if you are not using uh, interval ratio data, you'll have to use a similar non-parametric test. Just do a couple Google searches and you'll figure out which one fits best for the kind of data that you have or the sample size you have. Honestly, when you do a, a non-parametric test and a comparable parametric test, they're going to give really similar results. But um, if they don't, check to see if you violated some parametric assumption. Um, and we can talk about those another time. More or less, they're about sample size, about the distribution of the sample mean, some other things like that. Um, but, but really, there are all sorts of tools out there. The basic point here is trying to figure out what a uh, t-test does, a dependent sample, independent sample, paired, unpaired t-test, like why they do what they do, how you interpret those results, and then know that there are other tests out there if, those if, if you do violate those parametric assumptions, that there are other